my name is Smilin Markov, and um, I'm uh, studying, working on Byzantine philosophy and uh, theology. So I'm representing here the Byzantine tradition. Uh, when I saw the, the backdrop, the, the background, I mean the chess, the, the game of chess, I thought, I asked myself, could there be any parallels between what I'm going to say and uh, the game, the idea of a game? And I think one can find such parallels, but, um, uh, well, you have to wait until the end, I think, for, for that. Uh, what I'm going to do is to give you uh, some general remarks on the context of approaching love in Byzantine uh, theology and uh, speculative theology and philosophy. Then I'm going to try to present the context of uh, Nicita Sithatas, namely the uh, author whom I'm focused on, and and then I'll, uh, yeah, I'll present uh, his uh, notion on love. So, God is love. This is a very central statement in uh, Christianity. But uh, love, at least uh, in the Byzantine tradition, was never just a concept about God as other, among other concepts. The author of the Corpus Dionysiacum, uh, uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, who lists the names of God, denoting different concepts <coughs> about God, does indeed include love among the names, but he makes special qualifications. Uh, so love is not a very easy uh, notion. The Byzantine idea of love, uh, the theological idea of love, I mean, is uh, novel in respect uh, to the ancient philosophical tradition, although, of course, the ancient Greek concepts on love uh, are of utmost importance for understanding both the genealogy of the con concept uh, and uh, as well as the intellectual content. Of course, many elements in Byzantine anthropology and cosmo cosmology do come uh, from, uh, including love, do come from ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, however, there, are, there is a whole nexus of parameters that are alien to the ancient philosophical context, but are pertinent when Byzantine theologians reflect on love. Uh, concepts such as creation, freedom, incarnation, redemption, grace, prayer, and so on. Uh, so, notwithstanding how close a Christian thinker is to a particular model of love from ancient Greek philosophy, uh, there is also always some distancing uh, and some uh, specificity. Uh, take, for instance, origin. Origin does apply the traditional uh, Greek um, terms and concepts uh, of love, such as uh, eros, uh, agape, or philia. But when he uh, talks about divine love, and what does it mean that God is love, he uses another concept. He defines God as philanthropos, a uh, loving lover of mankind. And uh, this is not just uh, another term, this, this is a new, uh, a synthetic and to some extent a novel concept about God. Uh, what does it mean? Well, uh, God's love is special in that it doesn't indicate a deficit or an aspiration on the side of God to acquire something new, to make up for a deficit. Uh, philanthropy indicates a desire of God for co-working with humanity, and even more, desire for indwelling within humanity. 
what is more, it indicates a divine human project, which is to be developed in history, and which is characterized by openness and uh, vulnerability. Mm, in that sense, philanthropia does indeed bring something new. Of course, not a new aspect of God's essence that is impossible and unthinkable, but uh, it brings a new relation between God and humanity, between God and history, and it reveals a new dimension of uh, freedom. Uh, another interesting um, commentate on uh, love, on the topic of love, is uh, the uh, mentioned uh, Dionysius, or the author of the Corpus Dionysius. We don't know who this person is. Uh, although he enlists love among the divine names, um, there are some, some uh, complications. Uh, well, he calls God uh, divine love erotic. Uh, divine love is eros. And uh, following uh, uh, Plotinus, he um, claims that divine love is, implies going out of oneself and a return, prodos and epistrophe. This is the self-reflexivity of love, which is indeed a, a, yeah, a Greek philosophical concept I mean, from Plotinus. Uh, this is ecstatic love. God, God goes out of himself. Not out of a deficit or a need, but due to abundance of goodness. And he proceeds, he uh, descends uh, down the ontological hierarchy, which is his own creation, in order to bring it back to himself. Thus he reveals the uh, yeah, the, the, the structure of his goodness and the structure of the hierarchy and the principle of the hierarchy he has produced. However, it seems that the members of the hierarchy could only res but respond to this love and there seems to be no room for a uh, response with one's own uh, genuine uh, love. So, in other words, uh, creatures can love God only through divine love, according to their capacities, of course, which are different. But uh, what about their own love, and what about their freedom in loving? And here there is a problem, uh, and Dionysius, the author of the Corpus, I mean, is aware of this problem, and he proposes another version, he ascribes that to his teacher, Hierotheus, uh, but this version is actually quite different. In in that uh, in this in this uh, in this alternative version, uh, there are there is the divine love, but there are also different types of love, different types of eros, which are ascribed to the created beings. And the uh, the point is that uh, all these different types of love should be reunited, so to say, in a circular movement and should be unified in the divine love. However. Some of them would fail to do so. And here, uh, uh, evil uh, occurs. But uh, this implies that there can be love which has its source from God but fails to return to God. So the, the question uh, remains uh, quite open and, uh, and uh, uh, unclear. There are other attempts to uh, solve this problem. Uh, Maximus the Confessor is very uh, dis important for, for my author, for Neisitus, and a Maximus' solution is basically taking from Dionysius the idea of ecstasy, of love, as uh, going out of oneself, but uh, relating that to the personal level of existence. This is not uh, anymore on the level of the natural being, it is on the personal level of existence, and ecstasy means a person to be, to accept, to be defined by another person. Uh, so, uh, this is to get rid of all self-concepts and to accept, to agree, to be defined by the one beloved, according to this, uh, to this love. This is what, this is an act of freedom. 
And this is not only uh, an intellectual process. Of course, the intellectual is leading. The, the intellect is the leading agent here. But this is um, a, a coherent and a, um, a holistic uh, a process engaging all aspects of human being. And here there is, uh, the, it, it's an act of freedom. In other words, men in or human beings encounter God in an I thou relation, which is not hierarchical uh, anymore. So the, the idea of hierarchy is, is, uh, is uh, uh, transformed here, and we reach this level of interpersonal uh, communion. Uh, so let me now proceed to the second point, to the context of uh, Nicetas' uh, uh, Cetatus. Nicetas lived in the 11th century. He was born in 1005, uh, born most probably in Constantinople. He became a novice in the Studion Monastery in Constantinople at the age of 14, which is extremely early age and very, uh, very untypical, even on the verge of, of violating the rules, because uh, normally children aren't uh, uh, accepted in the Byzantine monastery. Uh, he was a follower and probably a disciple of Simeon the New Theologian, whose writings he edited. Later on, he was ordained a hero monk, which means a priest. Uh, and short before his death, he became the Gumenus Act of the Studian Monastery. Um, and uh, he was uh, engaged in many uh, debates, including... Uh, the, uh, the, the conflict between uh, the Latin Cardinal Humbert of Silva Candida and Patriarch Michael Carolarius. Uh, the conflict, namely, which led to the notorious schism of 1054 between the Latin Church and the Constantinopolitan uh, Church. Uh, this is just to illustrate how, um, how deep he, he was uh, delved into, into, into um, uh, political and intellectual life of the, uh, of the capital. But uh, the Studion Monastery is a specific, has some specificity and it's worth mentioning it. Uh, in order to understand the position of the Uber of Nicetas in the context of Byzantine discourse on love, one has to be aware of the spiritual and intellectual atmosphere in this monastery, the Studion Monastery. It was founded in the 5th century, but it was only during the iconoclastic period, namely after the 8th century, that this monastery became a significant center of Byzantine spirituality. The monastery represents a specific kind of monasticism, different from both the traditional Cenobitic and Hermetic monastic practices. The Studian monastery is not the only urban monastery in the capital, but it became the most important intellectual center after the 9th century. Um, it had a very rich library, and the monastic rule prescribed that every uh, that uh, during their spare time, monks are obliged to read and books and to work in the library, and there were special regulations about that. So the intellectual activity was uh, in the core of the uh, monastic discipline in this particular place. Some of the monks were responsible for also for spiritual direction of lay people. They were called elders. Some of them even performed confessions of lay people without being ordained. As a layman, Nicetas was uh, attracted uh, to the circle of Simeon, the new theologian, he was, and who was a famous elder from the Studian Monastery, although he, never, he was never an uh, act. Uh, so he didn't uh, have any administrative administrative position, but he was a spiritual authority, uh, an authority not only for the monks, but obviously for a circle of, uh, of uh, lay people. And uh, Simeon, the new theologian, was a paragon, the leader of a protest against the favorization of discursive theology, which took place in the monastic uh, school, uh, in the student monastery. So uh, the student monastery, the, the intellectual uh, life there was uh, pretty much a reaction against uh, iconoclasm, which implied some anti-intellectualistic tendencies, especially in, in its theology. But then, within this circle, a new tendency arose <coughs> in the 11th century, uh, the, uh, which, uh, which aimed, 
at, uh, so to say, distancing from this uh, speculative uh, aspects of, of, uh, of, uh, of theology, claiming that, of course, speculation is not bad in itself, but still, it is. It must be. It must be uh, in service of. It must be an expression of experience. Experience is what is. Uh, uh, yeah, what, ha what has the priority, and uh, although this is a very standard uh, status quo in Byzantine intellectual culture, uh, the teacher of Nicetas Simeon dared to uh, give account of his personal mystical experience, and this was unprecedented. You would never retell, you would never present your own encounter with God as a proof for anything in theology. And uh, Simeon kind of broke this, this uh, tradition, and of course it caused uh, a scandal. Uh, and he was, he was accused also of being too anthropocentric. And I think here there is, there is a common element between my author and Minlip's author, because uh, from what I know, uh, Abdullah Ansari was also accused of, of that, of being too anthropocentric. Uh, so the uh, Nicetus' uh, speculation uh, and uh, uh, his theological discourse is uh, influenced by his encounter with Simeon, and I would even claim uh, that uh, his take on love is um, is um, instigated by the question, how is it possible, and why is it possible, uh, for divine love to be experienced in, in, uh, <clears throat> yeah, in, in uh, a human, uh, in the empirical human existence, and what are the consequences? And I'd like to just uh, quote a brief uh, passage of, uh, from Nicetas' um, account of the life of Simeon, the new theologian, uh, namely a vision. This is a description of vision. Just to illustrate how important love is in this context. Uh, I quote, if there exists someone who has explained this to him before, since he has already come to know God, he comes to that person and tells him, I have seen. The elder asks, what did you see, my child? A light, my father, a sweet light, and my mind does not know how to describe it to you. At once the space of myself vanished, and the world disappeared. I was left alone with this light. There was ineffable joy, which is still in me, and great love and desire, so that streams of tears flowed out of me, as you see now. And he, the elder, that is, answers and tells him, It is he, my child. Uh, end of quote. Uh, so uh, this is... Uh, uh, yeah, well, this is il uh, illustrates the, the spiritual atmosphere and uh, that love and desire are at the content of this, uh, of this um, experience. Uh, in his uh, account on love, Nicetas um, adopts a concept about divine image, uh, which is, I think, pivotal, and it serves as a methodological principle understanding uh, the different aspects uh, of love. Normally, traditionally, divine image in, in man is defined through certain capacities like uh, ra um, uh, uh, reason, will, uh, and so on. Uh, but for Nicetas, the divine man image, uh, yeah, capacities that reflect some properties of, of, of God, some capacities uh, of, of, uh, of God. Uh, he uh, emphasizes that divine image is not a mere reflection of the divine. Um, the divine image is, uh, on the contrary, is, has to do with the role of man, of, of human beings, uh, as a mediator between visible and invisible. Uh, Nicetus compares human intellect with altar in which, on which the sacrament is fulfilled. And this is the sacrament of transforming the world, nothing less than the entire world. Because, he says, uh, 
in human being, all elements of the creative world are, are um, depicted in an analogical way. They are present as analogies. And transforming human existence is actually transforming the world. The direction of this transformation is the kingdom of God, uh, which has to be embodied by, uh, uh, by man in uh, his uh, spiritual activity, in his action, in this uh, mystagogy. So uh, not a quantitative, but a purely qualitative uh, uh, understanding of uh, the divine image, and it has uh, very important consequences. First, human life is not just a condition or a property of the, the nature. It is also a power enabling knowledge and prophecy. By, according to, be it, to, to human being, uh, humans, human, humans are able, to, able uh, to, to know the world and to be prophets of the world. This means to, to direct or redirect the development of this world. Second, life is not a um, natural characteristic merely. It is accepting a selfhood. Uh, a personal uniqueness from God, and this is how Nicetus interprets the the, the uh, man became a living soul. This verse from uh, Genesis. This means a personal image, a personal uniqueness was bestowed to man, and this is what makes hum human beings alive and alive as human beings. Then, of course, this is the responsibility, and this is an eschatological responsibility to transform the world into heavenly kingdom. And also the immortality of the soul, this uh, idea. Uh, the immortality is not merely based on the self-moving or self-reflexivity of an intelligent, intelligible essence, as it is in Neoplatonic philosophy, Plotinus, Proclus, and so on. It has to do with the fact that the soul is in matter and in body. It is through the body that the soul realizes its cognitive and providential activity, that is why uh, the soul, we can say that the soul is immortal exactly because it has a body to enliven in and it has a body in which it is uh, embodied. Uh, here we can see um, a replica of uh, a very popular philosophical model in the 11th century, popular among learned circles in Byzantine intellectual uh, uh, life, uh, the Proclean, Pro, the Proclus idea of, uh, of, uh, of love. Uh, well, uh, Proclus uh, differs from Plotinus in that, whereas for Plotinus, the intellectual love is a self-reflection of the intellect who comes out of itself and returns. For Proclus, uh, the superior intellect loves not only um, uh, not by returning to itself, by but by exer exercising a provi providence uh, in respect of the inferior uh, beings. So it is uh, eros pronoitikos, providential love. Uh, this idea became popular in uh, among even among Christian authors. Actually, Nicetus uh, is not uh, happy with it because it again it it um, de defies the uh, the um, uh, wholeness and the um, uniqueness of uh, of human being. But uh, he uh, kind of takes this idea of eros pronoitikos and shows that this eros pronoitikos is actually a divine human project. It is a synergy between uh, man and God, where uh, man and God act as free, loving uh, agents. And uh, this, this, this is uh, the, the second important idea is that love uh, is very much connected in Nicetas' discourse with vulnerability. He describes this as compassion, sympathy, uh, humbleness. So instead of feeling a deficit or acquiring uh, something new or even ascending, love means becoming more and more uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to the other person and vulnerable to divine love in a Christ-like manner. So we can see here an entire 
grammar of redefining uh, the uh, passionate aspects or connotations of love, those that have to do with passion, with the desire, and he uses, I don't have time to, 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 to list uh, all of his uh, vocabulary, the, his vocabulary of love. But uh, the main purpose is to, to try to, re, uh, to, to, to change all the, the semantics of this passionate uh, desire and to show that uh, uh, through the, the, the passions can be ways of becoming vulnerable in terms of an I thou relations with the neighbor, with the other fellow uh, human beings, and with, uh, with God, just uh, thus, uh, thus acquiring divine uh, uh, philanthropia. A third aspect uh, is that all the, di uh, or third point is that all different aspects of love, eros, agape, uh, he, he uses uh, uh, pothos, philia, like a fellowship, uh, and it, meaning not only fellowship with human beings, a fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, all of them seem to have two, uh, two, uh, two forms, so to say. He always says, love is in the beginning and in the end, but it is in a way transfigured. Uh, for example, take, just to take an example of agape, in order to exercise, to practice agape, one of course has to stop the passions, to mortify uh, uh, the, the passions, to escape from everything that connects, uh, connects the human being with, in the nexus of the worldly and, and material powers, deficits, needs, and so on. But this is only the beginning. In the end, we see that the fulfilled agape leads to humility, which enables the human person to internalize all the dimensions of the world, all the creatures even, in itself, but, uh, and to become, uh, to become an agent in that sense of uh, divine, divine providence, of divine, um, of divine uh, promise. And uh, just in conclusion, because my time is uh, running, uh, this uh, transfiguration of love is for Nicetas, not only a transformation of the world, but also uh, a revelation of the Trinity. It is actually a better way of, un of understanding and of, of contemplating uh, the presence of the Trinitarian God. And what is more, it is the way to become participant in the relations between the persons of the Trinity. Now, this is a very controversial point because in Exeter, even in his lifetime, and funny enough, even today, he is accused of some heret <coughs> developing some heretical Trinitarian models uh, because uh, the, 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 the way he describes this revelation of the Trinity doesn't seem to, to coincide with the uh, with, with the formula of the father uh, 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 giving birth to the son and uh, proceeding uh, and producing uh, the Holy Spirit according to the Orthodox uh, model. Actually, uh, he is interested not in, the, uh, form, in, in this formula. He knows it and he, uh, well, he, he accepts it. What he develops is the way this uh, dynamic is, uh, so to say, is uh, mirrored or is... Um, realized in uh, uh, human uh, existence and and in that uh, in that uh, the um, we don't have a hierarchy uh, we have uh, rather uh, something which reminds me of what Peter has shown here uh, a table and, and this is this imagery is in Nicetas I'm not making uh, it's sitting around the table and having participating in a feast. This is the Trinitarian feast. Uh, this feast is a feast of love, he says, but this is also a feast of wisdom. And of course, it reveals the, uh, the um, uh, well, the taxes, the order of Trinitarian relations, but uh, also it reveals the uh, interpersonal communion between the Trinitarian <coughs> persons. Interesting enough, uh, this, this imagery is very corporeal. It is 
uh, he, he, he wants to, to emphasize, and I think here he has an antignostic uh, uh, motivation to emphasize that uh, the body, the corporeal, the embodied aspects of human being aren't uh, excluded uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, um, in this new uh, heavenly kingdom. On the contrary, they are present, and it is through them that actually the wisdom of this of this loving God uh, is uh, revealed. So, I think I will rest my case here and give the floor to Minister.